Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our evening worship. Just a few announcements as, as in this, this morning. Uh, our Tuesday night Bible study at 8 p.m. And then on Thursday, Thursday evening at 8 p.m., the ladies' Bible study. And then on the 21st of this month, that's two weeks' time, we're having a missionary lunch after the morning service. Uh, and that will be a collection of that service for every home crusade. That's uh, <coughs> a local factory down there that produces literature to send out all over the world. Uh, it's a worthy cause, and I would, uh, hope you would come to, along to that missionary lunch. And then this morning there was a, a, an announcement for the ladies' outing, which I made a bit of a mess of. <laughs> I, didn't know, I didn't know anything about it until I came out to, to the lectern here. But the ladies are having an outing on the 25th of May. Uh, you have got invitations in your pew, uh, so you can fill those in at your own leisure and, and uh, return them to any member of the uh, Women's Fellowship Committee. That's all by way of announcement. Uh, I'd just like to welcome Robert again, and I look forward to his ministry again. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Gordon, for your kind words of welcome. Uh, I was reminding the elders this evening that it used to be a chore of mine on a Saturday evening getting all the announcements in order uh, for the next day. Uh, and that's something I don't miss. Uh, other men do it for me now, so that's, that's good. One of the benefits of retirement. Uh, just want to say that I heard uh, just uh, this morning that this is the 30th anniversary this month when up to a million people in Rwanda were murdered. It was an intertribal uh, between the Hutsis and the Tutsis, and uh, there was just a massacre uh, that took place over 100 days. So imagine a million people being killed in, in a Rwanda's about almost twice the size of Northern Ireland, so it's not a big, big country. And they've been recovering ever, ever since. Uh, and so uh, the, the Christian church is at work there, and, and God, is, God is at work. And so there, there's, uh, the movement of the Spirit is continuing to so remember Uyanda. Uh, of course, that's in, the, that's in the east side of Africa. And then with our own RP congregation over in the other side of Africa, in West Africa, uh, in the Gambia. And uh, it's a man there, he's the minister, Sylvester Conte. And uh, I had the privilege of, of listening to his sermons over his training and evaluating them and giving him some help and, and counsel and advice. So we'll, we'll be remembering Africa and these places this evening. As well as that, uh, uh, Kenny, Kenny, Stewart, uh, Kenny Stevenson will, will appreciate your, uh, your prayers. This is his second week of examinations. Uh, so he's, he got through his first week. And it's another week, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. And then that will be his exams finished, and God willing, he'll be graduating then at the uh, closing lecture of the college, which this year is in Limbavati. Uh, that's on the 23rd, uh, 23rd of, of, of this month. <clears throat> After that, he goes for his placement, a six month placement to Notbracken. So that will then, after four months, he'll be available for a call. Our call to worship this evening comes from Psalm 147. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant, and praise is beautiful. And we turn then to Psalm 113. Psalm 113, uh, and it's the B selection. And we'll sing all of this psalm. Um, Praise Jehovah, praise the Lord. Ye his servants, praise accord. Blessed be Jehovah's name, evermore his praise proclaim. And then we read in stanza three, uh, a reference to uh, the incarnation. Who is like the Lord our God? High in heaven is his abode. Who himself doth humble low things in heaven and earth to know. And so... Uh, Christ did leave heaven's glory and he took up residence on earth, taking to himself something he'd never taken to himself before, a human body and a reasonable soul uh, to represent us and to live and die on our behalf. Psalm 113b, uh, the whole psalm, let us praise God.
pray. <clears throat> uh, Lord God Almighty, we do thank you for the evening hour of worship. When once again on your day we can draw near into your presence, uh, knowing that you are our God, knowing that you are the one who uh, loved us and gave your Son to save us from our sins. And so we thank you for the incarnation. We thank you that uh, Jesus left uh, the Father's side in heaven uh, to come to this earth, being born of a woman, being born under the law, to save those who are under the law, that we might receive the full adoption of sons. And so, our Father, we thank you for this grace wherein we stand, and we bless you, Father, uh, for so great salvation. Uh, and, Father, we thank you that we worship a sovereign God, uh, a God who is in control of all things in heaven and on earth. Uh, we thank you, Father, for your eternal decree that you have foreordained whatsoever comes to pass for your own glory and for the good of your people and your church here on earth. And our Father, as we do think of who you are, the High and Holy One, we remember who we are, uh, creatures of the dust and of the day, uh, so inclined to go astray. The remaining corruption of our old nature still clings to us, and so we sin every day in thought and word and deed. But we thank you, Father, that with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared, that you may be revered, that you may be loved and cherished. And so, our Father, we do pray that you'd help us uh, daily to die unto sin and to live unto righteousness, that we might put to death the old nature and fan into flame the new nature. We thank you for the help of the Holy Spirit in this regard. And so we do pray that we might rest and rely on the Spirit, and that the fruit of the Spirit may become increasingly obvious in our lives. Our Father, we do thank you for the peace and tranquility of this evening, none daring to hinder us or to make us afraid. And so we thank you for these providential circumstances. We think of other parts of the world where that is not the case, where some of your people are meeting together in fear and in trepidation of what what may happen in a moment's time. And Father, we transmit our minds back uh, 30 years to what happened in Rwanda, how that there was a massacre uh, between uh, the peoples of opposing tribes. And so, our Father, we, we think of loved ones who still bear the scars of that horrendous event. And we do pray for the building up of your church in Rwanda. And we thank you for those who are active in that regard. We think, Father, of the uh, small, uh, growing, developing congregation in the Gambia, in Burundi. Uh, we thank you, Father, for our Bricama. We thank you for the, uh, your servant, Sylvester Conte, and the work that he's doing there. Uh, bless him and, and those of his uh, members in the congregation who are reaching out to their neighbors with the gospel of the grace of God. And we do pray that the church there will prosper and increase. So, our Father, we, we look to you now uh, to bless us here in the reading and the preaching of the word. And all we ask us in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. We'll turn now to the uh, book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah, chapter 42. And reading verses 1 to 12. <clears throat> and then we'll turn to Philippians chapter 4 for our New Testament reading. And uh, Isaiah 42 introduces us to the servant of the Lord, uh, a name given to the second person of the Godhead, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so there's a prophetic word here about him especially about his humility, uh, his meekness, his gentleness. Isaiah 42 and verse 1. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out nor raise his voice. 
nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth, and the coastland shall wait for his law. Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out. He spread forth the earth and that which comes from it. He gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness you will, and will hold your hand, and I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Sing to the Lord a new song, and his praise from the ends of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that is in it, you coastlands and you inhabitants of them, let the wilderness and the cities lift up their voice, the villages that Keter inhabits. Let the inhabitants of Selah sing, let them shout from the top of the mountains. Let them give glory to the Lord and declare his praise to the coastlines. The Lord shall go forth like a mighty man. He shall stir up his seed like a man of war. He shall cry out, yes, shout aloud. He shall prevail against his enemies. And then we turn over to uh, the New Testament book of Philippians. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 4. And beginning to read at verse 1 through to verse 9. Paul writing to the church at Philippi, uh, we know at least of the name of one person who belonged to this church, uh, and that was Lydia. She was the first convert in, in Lydia. Then we know of the jailer uh, at Philippi and his family, and of course we know the two ladies mentioned here, Euodia and Syntyche. So that's the context. And so some years after the church was founded uh, in Paul's missionary journey, he writes this letter to them, and it's God's word to us this evening. Therefore, my beloved and long for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. I implore you, Odia, and I implore Syntyche, to be of the same mind in the Lord. I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you heard and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. Amen. So reads God's holy and infallible word. And we now turn to the Psalms again, Psalm 138. <coughs> the A selection of the Psalm. <coughs> And we sing the entire psalm. <clears throat> With all my heart, I'll give you thanks. Before the gods, I'll sing your praise. I'll towards your holy temple by and thank you for your truth and grace. 
And then we think particularly of what we read in stanza four. Although the Lord is very high, he looks on those who lowly be. Whereas the proud and haughty ones, them only from afar knows he. And so it behoves us to be, uh, to be humble in our attitude and outlook uh, and gentle uh, as the Lord was gentle. Uh, psalm 138, a selection, the whole psalm, let us praise God and then remain standing for prayer. <clears throat> Our Father, we, we do thank you for the great and precious promises in your word. When Jesus said, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. And so we have the assurance that you won't abandon your people, uh, whether we are going through times of trouble or whether we are facing uh, whatever challenges the world throws at us, we can be assured of your presence with us always. Uh, and we thank you, Father, for your presence with your church and for the help that this particular branch of the church has known, not only in recent days, but throughout the centuries past. And Father, we, we implore your help for the present. Uh, we think of the, the great need of men for ministry, and so we pray for, for men to come forward for the, the next intake of the college in September. We thank you for those who have already indicated uh, uh, that they are, uh, they are preparing for ministry. And yet, our Father, we look for more so that we will not only be able to occupy all our pulpits, but be able to reach out uh, in mission and ministry elsewhere. And we thank you, Father, for the men who have gone out. Uh, we thank you for Warren Peel uh, in Galway. Uh, we thank you for Vincent MacDonald in Limerick. We thank you for Andrew uh, Little uh, in Nantes in France. Uh, we thank you for Isaac Berakol in Seville in Spain. 
Uh, and so, our Father, as these men labor in word and doctrine, we do pray that they will know your good hand upon them. Uh, we thank you for all that uh, we hear and for the blessings that are presently being enjoyed. And grant our Father that, that they will see further blessing as they preach and proclaim your word week in and week out. And Father, we, we thank you for uh, Kenny Stevenson, who has uh, completed one year of exams, and for uh, this incoming week, we pray that you'll help him on Tuesday and Thursday and Friday uh, as he would complete these exams and uh, be ready for, for his graduate placement in the summer. Uh, and so we pray that you will bless him and not bracken uh, as he works along with, with Peter Jemfrey. Uh, grant that he will, uh, be gain, he will gain further experience and be uh, better equipped for the work of ministry and that you will prepare him for the call or calls that he will receive in the autumn. And our Father, we, we, we do look to you for uh, your hand of blessing upon us this evening. Uh, we thank you that uh, we are your, your children and you look down upon us in mercy and that all things do work together for good to those that love God and to those who are the called according to his purpose. So bless us abundantly and for your own name's sake and for your glory. Amen. Well, turn with me again to uh, the book of Philippians. Uh, and I've entitled the sermon this evening, A Snapshot of a Christian. A Snapshot of a Christian. What does a Christian look like? Well, Paul, in this fourth chapter of Philippians, helps us to discover the answer, I believe. In verse 1, a Christian is a person who is prepared to stand fast or stand firm in the Lord. In other words, his life is based on principles, biblical principles. And in the course of his life, he sticks to his principles. And in that way, he honors his Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. A Christian is also one who gets on well with other people, especially fellow believers. And so if a difference of opinion occurs, as it obviously did here in Philippi between Neodia and Syntyche, then effort, effort must be made at reconciliation. A Christian is also a person who radiates a joyful spirit, even in adversity, even in hard times. Uh, and that joyfulness arises because of his union with Jesus Christ and because of the Holy Spirit dwelling in his heart. The fruit of the Spirit is joy. Notice Paul's command in verse 4. Uh, rejoice in the Lord always. Again I will say rejoice. Uh, Psalm 34 is, is one of the psalms that we often sing and it begins... At all times I will bless the Lord. His praise shall continually be in my mouth, in the good times and the times that are not so good. Well, this evening we see an aspect of what a Christian looks like in verse 5. This is where we want to concentrate our attention. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. And in approaching this text, we will, we will concentrate on one word, the word translated gentleness. As a church, we believe in verbal inspiration. That means that every word in Scripture, in fact, every syllable, every tense of Scripture is inspired, is God-given. And so here we have a word in the original that is rich and dynamic, a word which should shape every believer's behavior and conduct. And as I will explain in a moment, this word, uh, gentleness, is uh, translated in a whole variety of ways. But we will use the word gentleness in the outline. The purpose of the sermon this evening is to explore the meaning of this word and then to face the challenge of that meaning in all our relationships in the home and in the church and in society around us. 
we will begin with its meaning, the meaning of gentleness. The word in the original, in the Greek language, has provided a challenge for Bible translators over the years. It is the only time that this word, translated gentleness, is used in the entire Greek New Testament. So, and it's difficult to get an exact English equivalent. And so in the translations, we find a number of variations around a common theme. For example, in the King James Version, it is translated moderation. Let your moderation be known to all men. Uh, in the New King James, as we've been reading, it's gentleness. New American Standard Version is forbearing spirit. NIV, also gentleness. English Standard Version, reasonableness. Other possible words suggested by commentators to communicate the meaning are a gentle forbearance, graciousness, a gracious disposition, sweet reasonableness, big-heartedness, and a generosity of spirit. A definition of the Greek word, which I believe is accurate and helpful, is as follows. The patient willingness to yield. Whenever such yielding, yielding is possible without violating any biblical principle. So I trust that by now you see that the word gentleness is an important word and that its meaning uh, should at least have begun to register in your mind. The patient willingness to yield whenever yielding is possible without violating any biblical principle. The Apostle Paul was, was asking these believers in Philippi to adopt a reasonable gentle, forbearing spirit towards all, towards everyone with whom they came into contact. That meant both within the church uh, at Philippi and outside its bounds within the city. And we are to do the same. Well, what does gentleness look like? Well, we take an illustration from driving the car, and I presume there's a few car drivers among us You're enjoying a drive along a country road. Suddenly, not far ahead, another driver emerges from a side road. You have to brake. Your heart begins to beat a little faster, but no one is any the worse. How do you react? Do you give the other driver in front of you a loud blast in the horn? Do you immediately draw alongside him and give him an angry glare, or possibly the the shaking of of a fist. After all, he was in the wrong. Well, I suggest to you that the text is saying to us, no loud blast of the horn. The text is saying to us, no angry glare. The text is saying to us, no shaking of the fist. Show some gentle forbearance. You don't know what was going on in the mind of the other driver to cause his indiscretion. Maybe the sun partially obstructed his vision. Maybe he was on his way to hospital to visit a sick child and had a lot on his mind. So show generosity of spirit. Be reasonable. Show gentleness. Or take another example from the world of retail. You're standing in front of the till along with other customers waiting to make a purchase. You know that you're next, but another customer catches the attention of the lady at the till and is about to get served before you. Will you immediately create a fuss and demand that you be served first? Or are you prepared to yield, to show a forbearing spirit? After all, no principle was at stake. I think you get what it means, but I'm not saying it's easy. There are obstacles, obstacles in fulfilling this particular Christian challenge. And that's where we move on to next. After the meaning of gentleness, we come to the obstacles to gentleness, the obstacles to gentleness. And we've had to think uh, 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 on two aspects of this uh, these obstacles. First of all, there's the obstacle within, 
And then there's the obstacle without. We'll deal with the obstacle within, first of all. There is what we call the remaining corruption of the old nature. Aspects of our sinful nature that keep clinging to us, even though we are born again, even though we are converted to Jesus Christ, even though we are Christian, even though we belong to the Saviour. This means that when presented with a situation where we ought to yield, when faced with the circumstances where we ought to demonstrate generosity of spirit, pride, yes, pride can swell up within our hearts. Pride can make us think of self and rights and the humiliation of giving way. That is the obstacle that we must admit is there. It is within all our hearts. For most of the time, it may lie dormant. But given an inflammatory situation, it can spring into life all so quickly and display its ugly self. Now that we have identified this obstacle, we must seek to subdue it. We must seek to suppress it. We must seek to put it to death. And we can't do that on our own. We need help. We need help from the Spirit of Christ, from Christ himself who said, without me you can do nothing. So we can't deal with sin on our own. We need the help of the Lord to do that. The bottom line is that we must heed the promptings of the Holy Spirit and suppress the influence of the evil one, of the devil, because he wants to press into action that remaining corruption within our hearts. So that's the the obstacle within. And then there's the obstacle without. The obstacle without. At this point, we're thinking about the influence of the society in which we live. Gentleness, graciousness, forbearance, reasonableness are not the kind of words that we find prominent uh, in our culture, in our society, in our community. In other words, it's not cool to be gentle, nor is it cool to be gracious, nor is it cool to show a forbearing or a reasonable spirit. More to the fore are the attitudes of self-assertiveness, displaying dominance, being forceful, exuding confidence, oozing in arrogance. And since this is the kind of world we live in, a world that is always attempting to squeeze us into its mold, we need to be on our guard. We need to be resolute in our determination to be otherworldly. We need to be determined to be like Christ, who always displayed a spirit of gentleness, who always displayed an attitude of humility. Christ who said, I am gentle and lowly in spirit. Remember what Isaiah prophesied about him in that reading from Isaiah 42, verses 2 and 3, about the servant of the Lord, about Christ. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a faintly burning wick he will not snuff out, he will not quench. If our gentleness, our reasonableness is to be known to everyone, to all men, if it is to be evident to all, then we must not be conformed to this world and its outlook and its thinking. We must not be conformed to this world and its attitudes. Rather, we must be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And our minds will only be renewed as God, by his Spirit, takes the word. The word read and the word preached, week in and week out. To change us more and more into the image of God's Son. To change us more and more into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, who is our supreme example. 
Peter, in his first letter, draws our attention to how Jesus reacted in the face of severe provocation. 1 Peter 2.21 For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. Uh, And then, a couple of verses later on, uh, we are given the example that we are to follow. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. The meaning of gentleness, the obstacles to gentleness. Now in the third place, and there are four points to the sermon this evening, the third place, the caricature of gentleness. The caricature of gentleness. There are some who think that our gentleness, that our forbearance, that our reasonableness is being prepared to give way in any and every situation, that it is being prepared to yield in any and every circumstance. But such a definition of gentleness is a caricature of its true meaning. It is a distortion of what it means to be reasonable, or to show gentleness. There will be situations and circumstances in life where we must not yield, where we must not give an inch, where we must not give a centimeter. There are principles that we hold to so steadfastly that it will give the appearance to others that that our spiritual feet are set in concrete. The text reinforces this. Paul had just said in this letter to these Philippians, Stand fast, thus in the Lord. Stand firm in the Lord. So we must get rid of the notion that gentleness implies an indifference regarding truth, a vagueness with regard to principle, a nebulous attitude with respect to morality. The Christian... The servant of the Lord is not the kind of person who is to be all things to all men in a wrong and unbiblical sense. He is not a person who is ready to compromise with evil. He is not a person who is prepared to barter for peace at any price. When Paul commanded the believers, let your gentleness be evident to all men, He was giving them a challenge that was perfectly consistent with standing fast or standing firm in the Lord. This takes us back to our original definition of gentleness. It is the patient willingness to yield whenever yielding is possible without violating any biblical principle. This means that the Christian the man or woman of God, is not to be spineless. Rather, he must demonstrate at all times that he is a person with backbone, a person who has strength of character, a person who is not easily swayed, a person who lives his life according to clearly defined biblical principle, a person who is inflexible whenever the honor of Christ is at stake, And whenever the glory of God is at issue. If anyone should attempt to dislodge you from clearly defined biblical principle, then you must make it clear to them that you're not prepared to budge. Listen to the resolve of Peter and John when they were called to forsake their Christ-given calling by the Sanhedrin the Jewish ruling council, Acts 4, 19 and 20. Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. They were not going to be silenced. Later, the collective resolve of the apostles, when further threatened by the Sanhedrin, was we ought to obey God rather than men. Having said that, 
In taking such a stand, you must do so in a spirit consistent with gentleness, a spirit that is consistent with reasonableness. We see that in 1 Peter 3, verses 15 and 16. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Well, we've explored the meaning of gentleness. We've looked at the obstacles to gentleness. We've thought about the caricature of gentleness. And now, now finally, the practice of gentleness. The practice of gentleness. We've already, to some extent, uh, alluded to this. But at this point, we want to be more precise by asking the question, to whom are we to show gentleness? Uh, And the text informs us to, to all men, Uh, to everyone. That means without exception. Well, we will look at three categories, very briefly, uh, the family, the church, and society. First of all, the family. It has been said that the measure of our Christianity uh, is how well we practice it at home. When no outside eye is upon us, apart, that is, from our immediate family, So let your gentleness be known and practiced at home. Husbands, as you relate to your wives. Wives, as you relate to your husbands. Parents, as you relate to your children. And what a blessing for children to grow up in the home where true Christian gentleness, where true Christian forbearance is always on display. As daddy relates to mummy, as mummy relates to daddy, and as parents relate to children. And what an impact such an attitude will make on members of the family not yet saved. First Peter 3, the opening verses. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. Then the church, as we function as a congregation, our gentleness should be known to every other member. You ought not to be known as someone who rides roughshod over the genuine and heartfelt feelings and aspirations of fellow members. You ought to be willing to see everyone else's point of view. And if no biblical principle is at stake, be always prepared to yield. Be prepared to admit that your brother's opinion is every bit as valid as yours and ought to be considered. And then society at large. We are to bear witness to a watching world, not only by the words that we speak, but also by the lives that we live. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. The Apostle Paul said of the Corinthian believers that they were like a letter, known and read by all, a letter Quote, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Written not in tablets of stone, but in tablets of human hearts. Likewise, our lives are like written letters, known and read by all whom we meet. And so that that brings out the challenging question. How does the letter of your life read? Does it commend the gospel that you believe? Are you displaying in the hoarding of your life that your life is is one of reasonableness? That your life displays gentleness? Are you being read as a person who displays humility in all your dealings with others? 
Are you known as someone who practices forbearance? Or have you the reputation of having an overbearing spirit? Take heed how you live. Let your gentleness be known to all men. And then Paul says, the Lord is at hand. What did he mean by that? Well, the challenge of these words may appear insurmountable. Especially as Calvin points out, the rage of the wicked is the more inflamed by our mildness, by our gentleness. And again he writes with reference to the wicked, the more the wicked see us prepared for enduring, the more they are emboldened to lay on injuries. I'm going to take an example from the Old Testament, the example of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Remember, Uh, when they were called before Nebuchadnezzar to answer why they had not bowed down before the golden image that they had set up, they they, they resolved before him that they would never bow down. And he was, we are told, increased in in rage. He was absolutely furious with them uh, and commanded that the fiery furnace be heated seven times greater so that they would be incinerated immediately. When they, he saw their mildness, their gentleness, their forbearance, he was greatly annoyed. He was inflamed and resolved to do them harm. In the face of such onslaughts, how are we able to show a spirit of gentleness? How are we able to display a spirit of forbearance? Only only because the Lord is at hand, only because the Lord is at our elbow. Remember the three going into the fiery furnace? There was a fourth who stood by them, beside them, and that was the Lord himself. And so the Lord is by your side to enable you to witness a good confession for the honor and glory of his name. Paul himself was severely tested when he made his first defense before the emperor in Rome. He was on his own for all his friends had deserted him. But Paul wasn't alone. The Lord was at his elbow. The Lord was at hand. 2 Timothy 4.17 But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. A snapshot of a Christian. What does a Christian look like? He is someone who stands fast, stands firm in the Lord. He's also a person whose gentleness and forbearance is known to everyone. In summary, a Christian is like his master, Jesus Christ, who called him out of darkness into his marvelous light that he might display to a watching world the excellencies of Jesus Christ. So make that your goal, to display in your life the excellencies of Jesus Christ, who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Amen. Let's call upon God in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we we do thank you for the challenge that one word of Scripture brings into our lives, the word gentleness. Uh, And we thank you that Jesus Christ uh, displayed that spirit in all his dealings with men. We thank you that the Holy Spirit enables us to live like Jesus Christ. And so we do pray that you would help us uh, to show forbearance, uh, to show gentleness, uh, to show reasonableness in our uh, dealings with members of our family, in relationship to uh, the church and our fellow members, and in relation to the world about us. Uh, We are uh, living letters known and read by all men, And grant our Father that as they read us, they may see something of Christ in us, and so bring glory and honor to your name. So, Father, bless us now as we will conclude our service, and to your name be the glory. Amen.
Well, we turn to one of the briefest psalms in the Psalter, Psalm 131, uh, which commends the spirit of gentleness, humility uh, to us. Psalm 131, and we take selection B. My heart not haughty is, O Lord, nor lifted up my eye. I'm not concerned with matters great or things too high, things for me too high. My soul I've stilled and quieted. I'm like a weaned child rest. My soul is like a weaned child who lies on his mother's breast. O Israel, let all your hope now in the Lord so be, both at this present time and then into eternity. Psalm 131b, let us praise God. Receive the blessing of the Lord. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.